Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Burns and Wilcox Transportation Insurance Webinar. Uh, we'll give uh, some more folks about another minute to join, and then we'll get on with our broadcast. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and begin? And today we'll be talking about what drives the transportation insurance market. Um, before we begin, I'd like to introduce our panel. Um, and our panel consists of John McGlynn, Director of Transportation for our Canadian Operations, Tyler Myers, Director of Transportation for our Dallas Fort Worth and Indianapolis office and Courtney Gall, transportation producer with our Indianapolis office. If you'd like to ask questions, please do so. You can submit your questions by typing that question in the questions box and clicking send. Let me share a little bit with you about our transportation practice group. Our U.S. Transportation National Practice Group consists of eight teams strategically located around the country. Our offices are located in San Francisco, Salt Lake City, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Dallas, so Texas is well represented, Indianapolis, Chicago, and Atlanta. Our team consists of over 25 professional producers and brokers, 120 carriers writing AL, APD, cargo, and excess. With these carriers, we write truck for hire, public, specialty auto risk from one unit to large risks. That's a little bit of backdrop with our with our national transportation practice group here in the US. John, can you share a little bit about the practice group there in the in Canada? Sure. Thank you, John. Uh, in um, in Canada, we're based in uh, Toronto. Uh, our team members uh, operate from our office here in downtown Toronto. And uh, we offer products that include uh, primarily motor truck cargo, uh, auto physical damage, uh, some excess liability, uh, higher, higher attachment points, um, as well as some other inland products like contractors equipment and uh, load brokering, you know. So uh, we deal with brokers, uh, independent brokers across the country. Uh, we work with our, our uh, local field offices to solicit business and certainly to give timely um, and competitive quotes. There you go, John. Back to you. Thanks, John. With all that information as a backdrop, let's get on with what everyone came here to talk about. Today, we'll be exploring what is going on in the transportation environment. We'll discuss the challenges motor carrier industry is facing, as well as current market conditions we are experiencing in the transportation insurance space. Finally, we will share some of our thoughts for both retailers and insureds on not only working with Burns and Wilcox, but also how we can work together to secure the best solution for your insureds. To start off, Courtney and Tyler will talk about the current insurance market and what they're seeing going on. Courtney, why don't you go ahead and begin? Yeah, so the state of the market as we see it today is progressively more competitive. Where we used to only see one carrier willing to offer terms on a specified account, um, they're now writing that account for years and years and more and more carriers are willing to offer quotes on those specified specialized risks. Um, Carriers are expanding their appetite and opening up for additional capacity. This means that even though renewal rates are jumping up to about seven to ten percent increase, um, and this is across the board, we're having new players on 
accounts that carriers necessarily would not have written originally. So this is causing insureds, agents, and brokers to shop all accounts to see who at the end of the day they can get them the best rates at the best price, but also in a quick and efficient way. Um, in our space, I'm seeing carriers increase their appetite. They're broadening the class of business they're willing to write, and they're expanding their territory and opening new programs to accommodate the influx of submissions. They're using data to better serve their needs and the insured's needs as well. Um, we're seeing data you know, used to not only make drivers and insured's accountable, but to better serve them in situations where they could use the data to perhaps win a case. Um, we're not really seeing carriers with specialized niches anymore, basically, um, at least in the trucking and specialty auto field. There's a broad range of markets being offered across the board, and it's an exciting time to be in the transportation industry, honestly, especially as an underwriter. Um, but along with the market space being more competitive, we're seeing um, some unique challenges in particular. We're seeing a lot, a number of driver issues, and I think Tyler can speak more to that. And I'm sorry about my dog. <laughs> Oh, sounds like worry. sounds like your dog is supporting everything you have to say, Courtney. Yes, <laughs> big fan, I am. Big fan. Uh, just to go over some of the the challenges regarding uh, the driver shortage, um, some of the attributes affecting uh, is is high turnover. Uh, we're seeing a consistent trend um, through the last decade, and that continues to um, uh, with an upward tra uh, trajectory. Um, unfortunately, uh, companies, you know, we're seeing small to mid-sized fleet, fleet have a difficult time getting uh, and retaining uh, drivers. Um, you know, some of these variables include, uh, you know, licensed drivers that that no longer want to be in the industry, and that's that's you know, reportedly um, an issue with low pay, uh, working conditions, uh, pay structure being based on mileage. We've seen a decrease in mileage. Um, with the utilization of ELD and 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 us, you know, the industry trying to get the the um, you know the overall mileage down um, to decrease you know overwork or or tired drivers, um, uh, you know, it, again in many cases the poor working conditions, benefits, time away from family, um, and just some of the solutions uh, to some of these issues, you know, would would be potentially increased mileage rate, um, a bonus based on performance. You know, we're seeing this utilized in, in telematics and ELD systems um, where we can record driver quality, uh, vehicle maintenance, um, inspections, you know, their their vehicle maintenance scores overall. Um, you know, just, just bonuses based on performance and obviously their their ability to manage manage loads effectively, of course. Um, you know, and, and also implementing some recruitment of foreign drivers and, and military and some evolution of, in the industry with being able to underwrite uh, the international driving exposure. Um, so those are just some solutions. Um, I'll pass it off to John. Thanks, Tyler. Um, I think we'll just uh, go ahead and continue on. Um, Courtney, do you want to chat a little bit about renewals, renewal retentions, what you're seeing going on in, in the marketplace here in transportation? Yeah, so renewal retentions are definitely in a decline right now. Um, as we continue to see new business submission activity increased, um, it's been offset by this decline in renewals, which is kind of crazy right now. Um, usually, I would say we see about 70 to 80% retention, um, but now we're seeing this retention rate drop almost to 50, sometimes 60% right in that ballpark. It's significantly lower than our historical norms, um, and it's inc this is due to the insured's feeling um, the rising pressure of overall cost to operate, which then affects the agency. So they want to retain the risk at all costs, which means shopping to more markets, um, taking advantage of all their options, and seeing what company can get them the best price for their client. Every renewal we see, we know it's going to be a battle to retain. Um, no matter how many years in business, we're seeing everything from 15 years in business to one year in business, and it's all being remarketed. So every account has been shopped due to how competitive the market is right now. 
insureds are shopping to multiple agents, agents are going to multiple brokers, and then us brokers, we have to go to multiple carriers to try and win this account. So it's a never ending cycle, honestly, when a submission first hits our desk, it's a race against others to get it out to markets. Um, it's a race to block those markets and then another sprint to get that agent to get that agent a quote in a timely manner. So this is just an overall outcome of the competitive nature that we already talked about in the transportation industry. And we don't see it letting up anytime soon. At the end of the day, even though our service standards may be the best or our quote was in first, more often than not, especially in the middle of inflation, insureds are gonna be worried about that bottom line. How much is this going to cost them? How much is it gonna cost their insureds to you know, retain this risk? And I think Tyler can probably tell you a little bit more about those costs. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, one of the variables uh, uh, affecting renewal retention is is the cost of operation. Um, and we're seeing this, you know, in regards to midterm cancellations as well, typically through, you know, with more of a small to midsize uh, trucking fleets. Um, and the operation cost is a con continued issue, uh, particularly over the last decade, as, as we've seen dramatic increases um, in purchase and lease payments. Um, increase in obviously increase in insurance premiums. We've seen that dramatically increase, um, specifically in you know, certain territories. Um, the repair and maintenance of equipment has increased uh, dramatically. Um, the, the ability, the quality assurance of, of manufactured units has decreased. Um, you know where you're getting, you know anywhere from maybe six to seven hundred thousand, where previously you were getting up to a million. Uh, miles out of a out of a unit, um, and then the cost to rebuild those those motors when they get to those mileage points has increased dramatically as well. So we're seeing um, the utilization of older units or re rebuilt units. Um, so that's a that's an area where the carriers and industries having to kind of adapt. Um, some of the um, issues with the operation cost affect the the business as a whole and the margins associated with it and their ability to stay in business and operate effectively um you know uh, the freight rates are are an issue as well they continue to to be a damper on the those profit margins and as we discussed uh, previously you know while the industry is trying to increase driver pay um although it's not it's not evolving at a, at a rate that's sustainable um, that is an, an additional cost as well as benefits that's hindering the operating cost of these of these companies. Again, resulting in, in a decrease in renewal retention just simply based on the companies going out of business or midterm cancellations that we're that we're seeing. Um, so um, those are those are dramatic issues that we're seeing uh, specifically the last year or the third quarter of 2022. It's been a it's been a, a trend specifically, um, but that's I believe that uh, John and Glenn will go into the the next topic. Uh, thanks. I mean, from a, a competitive perspective in Canada, we have you know a, a stark difference between the ultra competitive nature that uh, Tyler and Courtney described versus a very very tight market few participants in the standard uh, transportation insurance market here in canada and what we've seen is the emergence of we'll call it alternative capacities and and uh, and facilities uh primarily sponsored by you know independent brokers bringing in non-traditional capital because of the tightness and the lack of uh, a competitive structure that's uh, uh that exists since really 2019 when the market hardened. So things like building liability towers uh, and and just finding alternatives within the standard insurance product market has been um, really tough. The same economic backdrop that Tyler described um, exists here in Canada as well. You know, we have 2019 freight rates and 2023 cost uh, structures, inflation, has uh, taken a bite out of everybody's bottom line. And um, it's put a lot of pressure on 
you know, the independent broker here in Canada to find a solution for carriers that are looking for relief somewhere. And uh, the standard and traditional transportation insurance market isn't really accommodating that. So um, that's kind of where we are here, John. I'll pass back to John Woods. Yeah, thanks, John. I, it's interesting because I think, John, what you're experiencing up there in Canada is what we have experienced over maybe the last decade um, with as far as market capacity and rates and so on and so forth. And, and over the last six to eight months, we've seen an absolute dramatic change in that um, with the onslaught of new programs. Um, carriers making suggestions that maybe things are starting to turn around and seeing a reduction in rates, ultimately leading to significantly more um, competitive nature, um, driving down renewal retentions, uh, having to fight for renewals, um, but also on the other hand, seeing a significant amount of new business flow uh, so it's it, it's interesting to see uh, the two the two sides being so different. Um, you know whether you've been in this business for decades or just a few years, uh, the advancements in technology and their importance have been really phenomenal. Um, while we can all talk about advancements in physical truck technology, you know, such as automatic braking systems, lane departure systems, all forms of monitoring and tracking devices really want to focus on cameras and what many refer to as, as dash cams. You know, the technology can result in both positive and negative feedback, but the one thing it does accomplish is that it really tells a true story of what happens uh, when a claim occurs. When they first arrived on scene, there was a significant pushback in the driver community due to the kind of the quote unquote big brother scenario. Um, over time, I think drivers have become a little less resistant um, as they many times can exonerate a driver. Also, uh, it gives a an insured an ability to see what happened during a claim and actually give credit to a driver when they did everything good. Um, Today, many of the carriers that we actually work with and, and many of you work with uh, now offer subsidies to insureds for installing these cameras in, in their trucks. The value they're getting out of this technology is immeasurable. In many cases, the carriers are using the data from the ELDs and other vehicle reporting technology to develop a picture of what their book of business looks like you know, the lanes of travel that their, their insureds are going in, and ultimately where they want to focus their capital and underwriting focus and how to make their book more profitable. The primary benefit to insureds with the cameras is understanding the behaviors of the drivers and how they can help those drivers become even safer and better drivers through additional training. The primary benefits to the carrier is that mostly, most likely they always are able to get a first-hand account of a claim and how they can most effectively resolve that claim in the most cost-effective manner. Um, as I said, you know, so many of our carriers nowadays that we represent have gotten on board um, with these companies that produce these cameras and, mon and uh, produce managed services um provide subsidies for them um, many of them now are starting to make them mandatory for certain types of risks uh, and and i think that you know they will grow in importance um, as we continue to move forward um, john you got anything else you want to share about what's going on in canada what you're seeing um, I guess the only other thing that uh, I can add to that, John, is, you know, our acute awareness of the the impact on the transportation terms of the U.S. legal system. And uh, certainly that has become, uh, you know, one of the important issues in terms of helping uh, our brokers build 
uh, even higher liability towers. And at the same time, a reluctance of, I'll say, non-US based insurers to provide that capacity. So, um, you know, we're seeing the same uh, issues, or I will say, uh, adoption of technology. Certainly, there's no substitution for knowing what happened when it comes to uh, uh, defending an event, and cameras certainly assist in doing that. So, um, the only other thing that we're seeing uh, that I think would be important for some of our brokers is, you know, Lloyd's Canada is undergoing a review of its auto uh, participation in the. the auto physical damage in Canada. We're working with them and hopefully be able to provide um, additional capacity once some of their uh, uh, that review is done, hopefully this summer. So um, I think that kind of uh, covers it here, John, at least uh, right. for now. Thanks, John. Um, before we get into, you know, some uh, a couple of other items which are focused more around opportunities and and our tips and advice for brokers and questions. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't be a discussion about transportation uh, unless, you know, we made a few comments on, you know, nuclear verdicts. So kind of here are some, here are some thoughts and probably more my thoughts, uh, but also the thoughts of our team. Um, and, and the reality is with as much as we hope that nuclear verdicts were going to start to subside. And while we did see some of that during the pandemic, the reality is that they're not going away. Uh, and as a matter of fact, at least personally, um, I, I think they're going to get worse before they get better. Uh, that's an unfortunate part of, of the business that we're in. You know, in, in the last year with any type of information, which was 2021, there were over 5,000 truck and bus crashes which resulted in fatalities. Um, that was a 10% increase from three years previously. Uh, in those 5,000 accidents, there were over 5,600 fatalities, which was an increase of 8% from three years prior. So we're not, we're not seeing a reduction. We're actually obviously continuing to see an increase. Um, the states with the highest number of fatalities uh, probably everyone can guess Texas and California and Florida and New York and Illinois. And other than Louisiana, these are some of the states that also have the highest number of nuclear verdicts. Um, you know, some states have started to make some gains in tort reform. Those are Louisiana, Texas, and Florida, some of those states that have the largest number of nuclear verdicts. Um, the unfortunate part is that in those states where tort reform has kind of focused more on the bad faith reform, the non-economic damage caps, or modification to joint and several liability, the reforms really have done little to reduce large awards. You know, earlier this month, uh, the $100 million judgment against Werner Enterprises, which most of us see as a not at fault loss, um, was upheld in Texas. Uh, in Louisiana, the constituents when uh, were told that the actions that they were taking by placing cases in front of juries versus just in front of judges would ultimately result in rates going down 25%. Well, in reality, they've actually increased um, since since the introduction of that new reform. You now, we've seen states consider judgment caps of five million dollars uh, as the answer, and while it may positively affect the excess capacity in rates, it will do little really to change the way carriers address primary rates, uh, and, and ultimately. There does need to continue to be movement eliminating the judgments, but it must also be coupled with a clear acceptance of when an insured is at fault and when it is not, as well as finding a way to minimize or eliminate the element that sympathy enters the equation. Um, most people would say good luck to that. Um, I want to be positive about it, but I, I think it's 
it is unfortunately the nature of our business and something that we're going to have to deal with for years and years to come, uh, both on the carrier side and the insured side and the broker side. So that's kind of some comments regarding nuclear verdicts for better or worse. Um, let's talk about something a little more positive. Tyler, you want to share with them opportunities, what we're seeing as far as opportunities, um, what our market portfolio looks like, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, abso absolutely. I'd like to lighten it up a little bit. That was dark, John. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. For, in regards to opportunities, that we're seeing the submission flow dramatically increase, specifically, uh, you know, from the fourth quarter of last year into this year, um, and that's attributed to the what we discussed earlier is the the ever so difficult or you know decreasing margins, profit margins for companies, and and rising insurance costs and, and premiums going up. Um, so I mean, we're seeing midterm. Uh, marketing moves, renewals uh, being shopped more dramatically uh, than ever before, um, and you know that's that's one of the continues to be one of the the biggest variables uh, of the increase in in submission submission flow. So, um, that's also attributed to the increase in in specialty auto that we we specifically target specialty auto um, involving public and business auto. So. We're seeing more of these opportunities leave the standard market, um, and you know, these are typically, um, you know, profitable, uh, high retention, or higher retention than your, than your typical for hire trucking classes. Um, so we're seeing an increase in, in those opportunities and classes as well nationwide, um, and also an expansion in, in territories and our ability to quote nationwide. On, on a non-fleet and fleet basis, um, um, in specialty specialty auto and trucking. Um, you know, we offer a, a broad tier of products uh, that we can help utilize uh, and and market the the risk that we that we get in the in the door from um, from those more preferred accounts to um, challenging, moderately challenging to hyper distressed. Um, so we have a tier of products that can really assist our uh, our retailers and insureds uh, to put a good product together. Um, and also, and, and save the best for last is um, an increase in opportunities just simply based on on a demand for a personal working relationship. Um, you know, we see a, a void and continue to see a void in the marketplace with um, you know, folks being able to build positive, you know, personable relationships with individuals, um, and we we pride ourselves on on being able to communicate effectively um, and have that relationship with our our retailers um, with effective communication, uh, transparency, you know, and just really wanting to help you guys um, get the get the business as well. Um, I mean, so that that's those are the variables I see as far as our opportunities and the increase in opportunities and kind of where we're where we're focused. Again, the um, our demand for personal relationships and communication and services is stands out, and I believe that's our, the single most um, uh, variable for us. Um, I think, but Tyler, thanks for that. I yeah, I think the one thing I want to add um, mm -hmm. is that Burns and Wilcox Transportation Practice Group today uh, is better positioned with, you know, our portfolio of carriers than we ever have been before. Um, and I, I think that gives us an opportunity, a much greater opportunity to provide solutions for a much greater range of insureds than we ever have. Um, and I think that that we're starting to see the benefits of that um, in not only the the increased number of relationships that we have uh, with our retailers, um, but also at the size of our growing book of business. Um, and to help us capitalize on that, uh, Courtney, can you you want to share a, a few tips and advice for 
for brokers out there doing business with Burns and Wilcox? Yeah, um, I'll try to get through this pretty quickly, but um, basically, as we all know, carriers are different and require different information, um, depending on unit size, years in business, type of operation, where they're located, et cetera. Um, this is just a general outline of what most carriers are looking for. Obviously, first, it's going to be send in a complete submission. When we say this, if it's a trucking account, we'll need a specific application, a truck app, or even a supplemental if it's a unique risk like a hazmat hauler. Um, we typically need five years of currently valued loss runs. Some may not require that many years, but it's just a good rule of thumb to get five years to get a better idea of overall loss history, uh, frequency, and severity. Um, another item, currently valued MVRs for all drivers. Uh, now, this may not be a part of a submission that you need to send in, but I like to have it just because it gives us a better overall picture of driver quality. Um, last four quarters of IFTAs, those are international fuel tax agreements. We typically need those on any truck account with an unlimited um, radius. If it's a local hauler, you're probably not gonna see those. Um, you always need an updated unit drivers list. So for units, we need year, make, bin, um, model, and then drivers list, just need the pertinent information, name, date of birth, um, license information, and years of experience. For my fleet accounts, we need updated financials and safety information too. And I typically like to have a narrative of the account as well. It just helps in the overall understanding of what the insured does and then how they do their overall operation. It also helps me get a better idea of the account so I can express my concerns and give advice where necessary to not only the agent, but also to my carriers and get them a better idea of the account as well. So basically, for example, you know, if there's a large loss in an account that the insured's not at fault for, but there's a hundred thousand dollar reserve on it, we need to know all of the details on it. Why is the reserve so high? We need the police report, we need accident details, we need to know how they're changing their habits moving forward, and it helps us get that understanding of how that insured handles difficult situations and runs their company. So I know that's a long list, um, but it's just a basic idea of the information we require. But if we don't have a complete submission, we're not gonna turn an agent away. We're just gonna state what we need to make it complete. Um, say a small piece is missing, like loss runs from the fifth year. We're gonna send that into the carrier for you, but at the end of the day, we still need that complete submission. Um, just we can't accept a general information section. That's just not what we can do anymore. Um, until we get a complete submission, we can't move forward, unfortunately, and we won't be able to get it cleared with most carriers, honestly. Um, even with a complete submission, if we don't have accounts into carriers in a timely manner, um, then we're being blocked. We typically need them about 60 to 90 days out in the majority of cases, not all, but most. Um, speed and completeness is critical. Um, being first in is, a, is as important as having a complete submission, honestly. And then at the end of the day, we don't wanna waste an agent's time and I don't wanna waste anybody else's time either for that matter. Um, knowing what we need up front really helps. Um, it just helps us understand who has already been approached. It's, it's all about efficiency and understanding. Um, but I would just say be proactive and organized with your clients and I'm sorry, I took a few minutes, but John, do you, John McGlenn, do you have anything to add from the Canadian perspective on this? No, there's no substitution for a complete submission, Courtney. I couldn't agree more. Uh, the where we're seeing more opportunities these days is increased values of all kinds of commodities. Uh, the renewable energy has given us some opportunity to fill uh, high value uh, portions of, you know, a, a windmill or things like that, and really help our brokers. Uh, deal with higher value and uh, uh, a new variety of commodities that are being hauled across the country. Uh, timeliness is everything. And as Tyler said, you know, we're, we spend a lot of time building our relationships with our retailers so that they can rely on us and know that we're going to, you know, either answer the phone or respond to their emails um, and get a timely uh, competitive quote for them um, based on what they need. Back to you, John. Thanks, John. Um, we've covered a lot today. Uh, one of the most important things about these types of discussions is, is questions and answers. So 
like to spend the remainder of our time, um, you know, trying to answer the questions that we're getting, uh, pass some of these around. So what are the main coverages? Um, Courtney, why don't you take this one? What are the main coverages that a transportation policy offers? Yeah, so obviously you're gonna see auto liability. Um, you're gonna see motor truck cargo and auto physical damage. Sometimes we get that trucker's GL in there as well, but um, those are mainly the coverage, coverages that we see. Uh, you can also do excess auto, um, umbrella policies can be included in that, but that's just a general idea of what we can do within the practice group. Yeah, so within, within a typical primary commercial auto truck policy, specialty auto policy, You'll, you'll many times see the same coverages that you will see in a personal lines auto policy. Um, you know, UM, UIM, medical, auto liability, physical damage. And then you start getting into all the other necessary ones like the cargo and, and um, you know, excess um, things, things that might stand out a little bit different. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, if you have a question you want to ask, please do so by typing in the questions box and clicking send. Um, so here's one, who do we need to reach out to to submit a quote? What accord do you need? Um, more than happy to uh, send out a, a list of contacts. Uh, as I said, we have offices around the country uh, you can go to our website and you'll see a section for transportation and it'll have a list of contacts on that. Um, if you need more detailed information on that, more than happy to reach out to me. Um, and my email is jlwoods at burns-wilcox.com. Um, let's see. Um, Here's one, John. Can I ask what markets John McGlynn has available include full auto coverages? So it's a good it's a good way for you to kind of explain what you do in Canada, John. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, our our practice re revolves around you know auto physical damage and motor truck cargo and truckers general liability. There are three primary products. We don't have that auto liability component. Uh, there is very little, I should say almost none, but I think there might be one small wholesaler that can do a couple of trucks at any one point in time. But since really 2019, the wholesale market has been shut out of providing um, auto liability and compul I'll call compulsory coverages, which would include uh, DCPD and Ontario accident benefits. Um, and that's why, as I mentioned earlier, there's been um, an advent of retail-focused facilities uh, emerging, where they have a, a large client base of existing of existing customers that will move to a new facility. So, um, unfortunately, we can't offer that complete package, but we can help you place the auto physical damage truckers GL and motor truck cargo portion. Back to you, John. Thanks, John. Um, here's one that kind of um, is a question regarding what Courtney was talking about, but Tyler, can you answer this one? And uh, I think the answer is fairly, fairly easy and quick. Our MVR is mandatory. Yeah, t typically. I mean, this is why, it's it's situational, right? So, you know, I, I prefer, again, this goes back to relationships. I prefer a call or a narrative so we can we can have a discussion. But nine times out of 10, you'll be ahead of the game if you send MVRs. Um, that's just that's just where we're at currently. Um, if you if you don't have the capability of pulling MVRs, typically the insured does. Um, but, you know, again, it, it's situational. Let's have a conversation, see what the risk entails, you know, and, and then go from there. Okay. So I think ultimately the answer is ultimately we will need MVRs. 
Uh, the timing of when we get them or require them differs. Um, but yes, ultimately we will we will need currently valued MVRs typically. Um, here's one. Who are the top two or three carriers you're placing new business at with right now? That's always a dicey question to answer. Um, the reality is it depends on uh, the classes of business that we're seeing. Um, and, and that tends to be really cyclical. At one point in time, we were extremely heavy into, into truck for higher transportation. Um, recently, uh, that switched more to specialty auto and commercial. Auto. Um, but, you know, we do it all. I, I would tell you, you know, we write, we we have 30 40 auto liability markets probably got more than that in physical damage and the equal number in excess um but we what i can tell you is that we have every carrier pretty much every carrier out there that is writing transportation business we have access to right now uh, and they are all incredibly critical to our operation. Um, some days somebody's writing a little bit more than others, um, but I can tell you that we have every carrier that's out there um, and would suggest that, that you send the risk in, we'll evaluate it, we'll get it to the correct, get it to the correct place. Um, Courtney, how do you how do we get appointed, or do we just send in a submission? That's a good question. Um, you can send your agent information to any one of us, and typically we like to get the agent appointed before we work on accounts, just so that there's no stopping once an account gets to us, and then you want to bind it. So um, you just send your information to me we'll get you in contact with one of our operations managers and they'll get you set up with all the paperwork and everything it's a pretty easy process honestly so okay yeah there, there's um a... go ahead sorry tyler were you oh, saying... i was just going to say there's an enrollment yeah there's an enrollment kit and um i mean basically you know we want to verify that you know you're you're transportation focused or you have uh, the ability to source transportation uh, premium and, and, you know, kind of go from there um, and uh, you know, profile it, profile the, the retailer and, and, and go through the enrollment process. It's very quick and easy. Okay. Um, we're getting close on time here. A couple quick questions. Um, I'm going to try to run through these really quickly, if you don't mind. Uh, where's the increased competition coming from? Traditional carriers, existing players, new entrants, startup MGAs. Um, I think for our part, we're seeing most of the new competition come from uh, new specialty programs, uh, new MGAs, new capacity capital entering the market, naive as it might be, um, thinking that the transportation industry is getting, um, the performance is getting better and they can write things at cheaper rates. And the reality is that's not true. And we see this happen every once in a while, um, and then it just creates a lot of frustration in the marketplace. But I tell you, most of the new entrants we're seeing are NGAs and, and uh, new specialty programs. Um, what about an NEMT? Is that in your appetite, and do you have some guidance for what to look for there as far as differentiation? Um, can you do that in 30 seconds, Courtney? Yes, I see non-emergency medical risk all the time. So I have specific applications that if I hear from an agent, I'll send them directly and say, fill these out for me really quick. Um, like to have MVRs, but like we said, we'll see. And then currently valued loss runs for up to five years. Um, we need to know if they have any equipment in their units. Um, you know, how many seats their units hold and if they need filings. Um, if they're crossing state lines, they typically need filings and a certain limit. So we just need all that basic information to get the ball rolling on it and get that submission out the door as quickly as possible for you. So, all right. is that good? <laughs> Very good. Um, do you accept BORs and how many days in advance? Um, we, love to, we love to take BORs. 
Uh, unfortunately, our carriers just decide whether they will are willing to accept the BOR or not. Uh, some do, some don't. Uh, a lot of it depends on when it is in the process. If they've already released a quote, most likely they are not going to be willing to accept the BOR. Um, but it's always worth asking us, and uh, we will certainly make sure that we get um, get to a carrier. Um, I think I think our time may be up. Want to be respectful uh, for those of you that are attending. Um, and one last question: Do you have an excess carrier that will cover Prime? Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about Prime, the insurance company, or Prime, the carrier. Um, I will get back for, for for those of you who we have not been able to answer the questions for. Um, I will look to get a response to you um, in in the next within the next week. Uh, there's a number of questions we weren't able to get to, so it'll take me some time to get through these. But uh, we will get an answer to you by via email. Um, and if for some reason you have other questions, again, please feel free to reach out to me directly, JL Woods at burnsandwilcox.com. Um, well, burns slash wilcox.com, I guess is the correct email. Um, thank you so much. We appreciate everybody's time uh, and attendance, and uh, we look forward to doing business with each and every one of you. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your week and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you.